There are three things that are certain in life. Death, taxes, and Lamborghini's love of the V12 engine. They've used one in every single one of their flagship cars has had a V12 since their founding in 1964. And I want to talk about the history of that V12 engine, the history of Lamborghini's Bizzarini V12. We all know the story. It's one of the most famous in automotive history, but in case you've been in a coma for the last 60 years, Ferruccio Lamborghini was an Italian tractor conglomerate. And what does every wealthy Italian own by 1961? A Ferrari. Only Ferruccio's 250 GT was rather troublesome, and he didn't buy the whole as part of the Italian charm to break down spiel. So he disassembled his habitually broken clutch and saw that Ferrari didn't put much effort into the road car. So Lamborghini rebuilt his broken clutch to make it not explode every 20 kilometers and stopped by Marinella with some improvements. Il Commodore was not pleased to hear some random tractor guy telling him how to build a sports car and rather impolitely told him to bugger off. Ferruccio got pissed and decided to show Enzo how it's done. The 350 GT was a beautifully styled elegantly equipped GT car with a chassis by Dallara. Now all it needed was an engine. And Lamborghini was in luck. Bizzarini was an Italian engineer who specialized in making cars go faster. Way faster. After a brief stint in Alfa Romeo developing the Giulietta, he got hired by Ferrari as the head of sports GT development. The 3 liter V12 Testarossa race engine? That was him. His 250TR won the 24 Hours of Le Mans outright three times, and his 250GTO dominated the FIA GT class three years on the trot. Yeah, that 250GTO. But Ferrari back then was just as bad as Ferrari now, and Bizzarini hated it. He left Ferrari in 1961 over management issues and have formed ATS with a bunch of other former Ferrari employees. ATS ain't really around anymore, and Ferrari is, so that kind of tells you the whole story there. So when Lamborghini started to shop around for new engineers, he was the first one to accept. Now, Ferruccio told Bizzarini that he wanted a reliable road car first and a sports car second. That was the whole issue with his Ferraris, he wasn't going to be a hypocrite. But Lamborghini still wanted a V12, it's an Italian Grand Touring car after all. But Lamborghini didn't realize the sneakiness of Bizzarini when he signed his contract. You see, Bizzarini asked for a flat fee to match the 300 horsepower that his Ferrari engine made. And then he asked for a little extra money for each horsepower more than the Ferrari. Because he had a 1.5 liter V12 Formula 1 engine burning in his back pocket. So while Ferruccio was expecting a sporty road car, he was actually getting a full-bore racing engine. Bizzarini first enlarged his design from 1.5 liters to 3.5 liters for the bigger car, because road-going GT car, not exactly the same as a Formula 1 car. Then he took his Ferrari design and simply made it more. The Lamborghini V12 had quad cams, as opposed to the Ferrari's Dual. Then there were six carburetors instead of the usual three while semi-hemispherical combustion chambers made it easier to use bigger valves for a higher RPM. And I mean high. The prototype can make 400 horsepower at 11,000 RPM. It was an engineering marvel, and Ferruccio hated it. He wanted a road car, not whatever the hell that thing was, and refused to pay Bizzarini. Bizzarini promptly lawyered up and a deal was made where he was most likely paid for the 360 horsepower variant that was actually tested. And then they never saw each other again, which meant Lamborghini brought on Paloa Stanzani to tame Bizzarini's beast. The dry sump oil system was replaced with a wet sump. The compression ratio was reduced, and so were the cam profiles. The usage of high-quality materials was diminished to make the car more affordable. 
and the horizontal distributors were moved from the rear of the engine to the front for better packaging. The result of all of this was it went from 400 horsepower to 280, and from 11,000 RPM to 8,500 RPM, much more in line with the Grand Touring car that Ferruccio was expecting. The 350 GT was launched in 1964, and although only 120 were built, it announced Lamborghini as a legitimate Ferrari rival. But Lamborghini's engineers, they could do much more than that. The trio of Stanzani, Dallara, and Bob Wallace met up after hours and on the weekends to design a sports car that used racing principles. They had to do it on the weekends after hours because if Ferruccio knew about it, he would probably veto it because it went against his company values. And by company values, I mean this was not going to be a comfy Grand Touring car. The most important element of this new car that they were developing was taking the 350 GTs V12, rotating at 90 degrees, and mounting it behind the driver. That had never been done before, unless you count the Soviet T55 tank. Even F1 cars had longitudinally mounted mid-engine layouts, but a transverse V12 gave the Mura a wide track width and the balance of 50-50 weight distribution, marking the creation of a new era of performance car. Before the Mura, there were fast sports cars. But after it, there were bona fide supercars. And the layout managed to work with a bigger version of the V12 using a 4 liter variant from the 400 GT to make 345 horsepower in a 2900 pound car. The transverse layout allowed the team to use vertical downshaft carburetors to make it more like a race car. And with a Bertone style and body draped above it, the Mura was a masterpiece that changed the auto industry forever. Lamborghini leapfrogged Ferrari and forced them to play catch up. The Mura was the fastest production car in the world with a top speed of 179 miles an hour by the end of the decade. But the key word there is end of the decade, and a new flagship was needed by 1972. So Sanzani decided that the transverse layout, while incredibly impressive, wasn't efficient, and a longitudinal layout was necessary. A layout that was reflected in the new Countach. Only now the gearbox is in front of the V12, giving the Countach a massive bulge protruding into the cabin. This layout was another first for a road car, and it would prove very useful down the line. We'll put a pin in that and get back to it later. Now, the early years used the same V12 from the Mira, but eventually the engine was stripped down to the block and rebuilt. Now, 4.8 liters, it made 375 horsepower and 300 torque, which was on par with the Mira SV, but better technology allowed the Countach to break Lamborghini's own top speed record at 182 miles an hour. Eventually, they sorted out the new layout's teething issues, and by the time the 5000 QV came out, it had a 5.2 liter version of the Bizzarini V12 that made 440 horsepower. And the US spec models even had Bosch fuel injection for the first time to meet regulations. Now, the Countach lasted a lot longer than the Mira in terms of production time, but it was eventually replaced by the Diablo. And it had a new old V12 because Lamborghini officially entered the digital age. Sure, the base components were still the old Bizzarini design, just heavily modified, but now it had computer-controlled multi-point injection to make the engine meet regulations and exceed expectations. The goal of the Diablo was to hit 196 miles an hour, and with the computer controls and the four valves per cylinder and the 485 horsepower, it became the first Lamborghini to reach a top speed excess of 200 miles an hour when it hit 202. And it's a proper car, it's not even a sweaty death trap like the Countach. It had adjustable seats, power steering, anti-lock brakes, radio, even air conditioning that worked once in a while. But the biggest change between the Countach and the Diablo was the drivetrain. Let me take that pin out that I put in the Countach a while ago, because this is when that front mounted transmission becomes important. 
the placement in front of the engine made it very easy to add a four-wheel drive system to it. Up to 25% of the power could be sent to the front drive shaft. So the Diablo VT decreased the 0 to 60 time from 4.5 seconds to 4.2 as Lamborghini's first all-wheel drive supercar. And that was just to start. The SE30 version was built to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Lamborghini, so they left nothing on the table. Engine parts were cast out of magnesium, and the cylinder heads and the exhaust were redesigned to make 525 horsepower and 428 torque. That's some seriously impressive stuff for the end of the first generation of the Diablo because it went into a facelift for 1999, and the engine followed suit because they just can't leave this thing alone. Now up to 6 liters, it made 550 horsepower and was only available with the VT all-wheel drive system except for the limited run GT model. The GT was a rear-wheel drive track version of the Diablo, which meant it had carbon fiber, new air intakes, NACA ducts, no rear bumper, and optional airbags. Which makes it all the more hilarious that the air conditioning was standard equipment, but the airbags weren't. Sure, you could option them out, but you had to option in the airbags. You had to option out the air conditioning. <laughs> but it meant that the GT only weighed 3,200 pounds while being the most powerful Lamborghini ever built up to that point at 575 horsepower. It was a serious track weapon. And then Lamborghini found themselves in a rather unique situation for them, one that they'd never been in before. Flush with cash after being recently bought out by Volkswagen, which meant they got themselves a brand new flagship. A new flagship that somehow still used the Bizzarini engine 37 years later. Sure, the only thing left of his original design was the engine block layout and the upper crankcase, but that is an incredible lifespan, being nearly four decades old. And the 21st century gave this old dog one last great hurrah with the Merciago LP670-4 SV. SV is their long-standing Super Veloce badge, 4 represents the four-wheel drive system that is now the only option, and the 670 represents the 670 horsepower, 6.5 liter naturally aspirated V8. The SV was a crescendo of the Bizzarini era with four-wheel drive, quicker steering, and a carbon fiber aero package to make it a lightning quick Lambo. It did 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds, making it among the fastest accelerating cars in the world, really only being beaten by the Veyron. And the aero pack rear wing made the big Lambo nimble and responsive, things that have never been associated with Lamborghini before. But it can still do 211 miles an hour and make a damn good sound while doing it. And when the last one of the 350 units produced rolled off the line, it marked the end of an era. Because Lamborghini discontinued the Bizzarini engine line. The new Aventador had a brand spanking new 6.5 liter V12, their first new V12 since the 350 GT back in 1964. And now with the Cyan and the Revuto, the V12 has been hybridized to make over 1,000 horsepower to all four wheels. Lamborghini, Ferrari, and the Italian government are fighting to keep the V12 alive for the future, but honestly, who knows? So instead of looking towards a potentially bleak future, let's look back at a definitely bonkers past with some of the oddities that used the Bizzarini V12. On the road-going side, the Countach era had plenty of oddities, such as the Evolucione designed by Horacio Pagani, featuring a radical carbon Kevlar body and a remapped 5.2-liter V12 mounted to a short-throw shifter and a prototype four-wheel drive system. But Lamborghini didn't like Pagani that much, and the only thing they did with it was crash test it. Nice. Then there was a Countach Turbo S, which had the older 4.8 liter V12 with two turbos added to it, and when the driver turned up the turbo pressure to 1.5 bar of boost, 
It made 750 horsepower and 650 torque. If it had gone into production, it would have been the fastest and most powerful production car in the world. But like the Evolucione, Lamborghini didn't do anything with it except lose their prototypes for a few decades. Meanwhile, the normal version, i.e. the non-turbocharged rocket ship, did find itself into the LM002 I mentioned earlier, Lamborghini's obscure off-road military vehicle turned SUV powered by a massive V12 engine. Weird vehicle. Did a video on it. Quite nice. But the Countach engine fell on itself into an even stranger place than an off-road military vehicle designed for the super-rich. Offshore powerboat racing. Turns out, Ferruccio Lamborghini liked boating, and had put his V12s into personal watercraft for a number of years. So Lamborghini, the company, decided to give it a try. The 9.3 liter V12s made 900 horsepower and were used for powerboat racing in the mid-1980s. Super weird, super out of the blue. Meanwhile, on the circuits of racing, we have a large variety of obscure track versions of the Diablo, but honestly, I feel like I've talked about the Diablo a lot in this video, and I want to talk about something even more obscure than the Jota. Someone at Lamborghini did more coke than usual and decided to enter Formula One as an engine supplier. Now, technically, this isn't a Bizzarini engine because it had an 80 degree V12 instead of a 60 degree, but screw it, this is my video and I'm going to talk about it, okay? It debuted in 1989 with the La Russe Lola team, and reception was mixed. Everyone agreed it was the best sounding engine on the grid, but they also questioned whether the LE3512 could do itself justice, given the quality of the team it ran with. Turns out that quality was shared with the Lambo engine, as it was horrifically unreliable, only finishing six races and scoring one point in its debut season. But 1990 marked a significant improvement. Lotus signed on for that season, and when the engine did work, it had pace. It wasn't as good as McLaren or Ferrari, but Lotus got fifth in Hungary, and LaRousse even got on the podium in Japan after Prost and Senna had their little turn one incident. And then Lamborghini only had four more point scoring finishes, earning 20 points over their entire F1 career. Yes, McLaren did do a 750 horsepower test version with Senna in 1993, and yes, it showed pace, but McLaren thought it was just too unreliable and they passed on the engine despite Senna's support. So it's ironic, isn't it? Bizzarini essentially built the original Lamborghini V12 as a crazy monstrous racing engine, but when the Lamborghini V12 did find itself on the racetrack, it was kind of awful. So maybe it's best to just let the 48 years of road-going speed do the talking.